Welcome to Legitimate Matters. I'm your host, William Paris. I think it's an understatement to say that this country is extremely divided. I would go so far as to say that it's absolutely fragment, fragmented. And the things that are, taking, that are taking place in high positions within the government trickle right down to our communities. One thing that we're fighting against is regentrification and displacement of those of us that have lived in certain communities for years. And now through rezoning and all kinds of laws that are, that are being passed, we're being moved outside of our, away from our homes. Well, today my guest is Carmen Vega Rivera. And Carmen is a CASA leader. And for those of you that don't know, CASA is the Community Action for Safe Apartments. Carmen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, Carmen, you are a real fighter in the community. I've known you for years. But for my viewers, let's talk about uh, how long you've lived in the Bronx. Um, I came to the Bronx in 1979 mm -hmm. to work for the Bronx Museum of the Arts. I'm originally from Lower Manhattan, mm -hmm. but I actually moved 36 years ago to the Bronx. So I I've see. been living in the same building, same complex for 36 years. There seems to be, at least from my experience, I've lived in the Bronx now for about 18, now I think going on 19 years, which is hard to believe. Time goes so fast. But when someone says to me, uh, well, where do you live? And I say, oh, I'm, New I'm a New Yorker. And they go, oh, well, where do you live? And I know that if I say, because I've lived in every borough except, Manha except Staten Island, but if I say uh, Queens, they go, oh, I know people in Queens. Or if I say Brooklyn, oh, it's so amazing. But when you say the Bronx, they go, oh. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, why do you think that there's uh, a, a negative perception of the Bronx? Well, I get that old feeling as well. Mm -hmm. And usually my response is, are you in pain? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I don't know what else, but you know right. that that um, oh or that um, question of you know why are you living in the Bronx mm -hmm. comes from the perception right. that people have created um, about the Bronx, and there were some real things happening in the Bronx. So when people say the Bronx was burning, that mm -hmm. we were burning the Bronx, that's a fallacy. The Bronx okay. was burning. But it was the landlords burning the Bronx for insurance purposes, okay, and to wow. displace people because there was a flight in uh, the 70s when buildings, you know, complexes like co-op cities uh, were built and people right. were leaving. And so when they left to Long Island, mm -hmm. Westchester, mm -hmm. there was a flight of people that were living in the Bronx. And landlords didn't feel like they were gonna be able to get the same rent money or rent their complex. And so what they did was when uh, people of color started to move to the Bronx mm -hmm. is, that they, their option was to burn that building down for insurance purpose, and so that flight. And don't forget that the Bronx with other uh, communities was also a red line. And when you red line a community, basically what you're saying is let's disinvest, and let's, let disinvest in that community. So there were no mm -hmm. investments wow. coming into the community. And when you disinvest and landlords are burning buildings, you're taking away hospitals, mm -hmm. fire uh, uh, houses. Okay. You were taking away services you were taking away basic services from sanitation, policing, and don't, you know, redlining was not only happening in New York City, redlining was happening throughout the United States. This is a nationwide problem. And it still is. Yeah, right? a nationwide problem. Well, I know that you've been extremely active um, with CASA, and uh, CASA has made amazing strides and, and has amazing, has had amazing accomplish accomplishments over the years, but there's, what exactly is CASA and what is the uh, new settlement apartments? Help us to understand what that is. So as you said, CASA is the acronym for Community Actions for mm -hmm. Safe Apartments, and mm -hmm. it's a project of new settlement apartments. And new settlement apartment basically 20 plus years ago took buildings that were burned by the landlords, a whole uh, community in the Southwest Bronx, Townsend Avenue, Marcy, um, Avenue 
and they rebuilt these homes. So it's a, it's a CDC, a community development corporation, where they took buildings that were no longer being utilized, burnt. I mean, there was nothing. There were shells. That's amazing. There photos. Wow. And they rebuilt these complexes. And basically, they allowed folks who, I believe it was a third and a third, a uh, third that were homeless, a third low income, and a third um, low to middle income. Um, and, their subs and some apartments are subsidized. New Settlement is the overarching um, nonprofit. Okay, all right. And CASA is a project of New Settlement. I see. Such as they also have an after-school program, they have a college access, they have a parent action. So in that umbrella, you have other proje projects within that nonprofit. I, now I completely understand. So can you give us three examples of what is called collective action? Sure. So CASA's mission is to safeguard and protect affordable housing through collective action. And okay. collective action, CASA exists because CASA has tenants as members. Mm -hmm. You are a CASA member as soon as you set foot or participate in any CASA event or activity, workshop or meeting. So right now we have three um, campaigns that are very active. We've had other campaigns. Mm -hmm. The uh, act, uh, the first campaign that we've been having since um, 2012, mm -hmm. which we released a report in March of 2013 called Tipping the Scale, was reforming housing court. Okay. I don't know if you've ever experienced housing court, but um, I've had the pleasure of visiting housing court multiple times, being taken to court by my landlord for non-payment, mm -hmm. meaning that you're not making repairs, you're refusing to make repairs, I'm gonna withhold my rent and I'm not gonna pay you. And so I've been taken to court. In addition, I've sued my landlord, which is called a housing part, because he's failed to make that repair. So we, as tenants, came together in 2012 and said, there's something wrong with housing court. Absolutely. And we voted yes, for this know. campaign. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of things going wrong because many of us had experience um, you know, the situation when you go to housing court and it doesn't matter when you, you know, who you are when you go to housing court. It doesn't matter in terms of your race, your social economics. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. When you go to housing court, you are stripped of your dignity. Well, right. Well, I, it's amazing to me that landlords even, uh, get away with what I consider to be criminal. We're going to take a break, sure. but when we come back from break, we're going to talk about how landlords can even get away with uh, the types of actions uh, that, that take place, not just in the Bronx. And this is why it's important for my viewers to really pay attention. This is not the Bronx. We're using the Bronx as an example of what's happening across the country. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Legitimate Matters. <laughs> I'm a retired school psychologist and helping people was my thing. I was very independent and thought I could take care of myself. I fell and I had to have Meals on Wheels. After my stroke, when Meals on Wheels started, I was on the other end of the stick, so to speak. Meals on Wheels, coming to my door as someone who's housebound, having someone check on me, assures me that I'm not forgotten. Meals on Wheels has given me a mode of freedom that I wouldn't have otherwise. We are the clients. We are the clients. We are the clients of Meals on Wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. It's got nothing to do with fairness. Bam. Your whole world changes in an instant. And you never see it coming. That's what happened to me. The day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George and I want you to learn the signs of a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F. Face drooping. A. Arm weakness. S. Speech difficulty. T. Time to call 911. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke. F. A. S. T. Fast.
Welcome back to Legitimate Matters. This is your host, William Paris. I'm here today with Carmen Vega Rivera from CASA, the Community Action for Safe Apartments. Uh, just before we went to break, Carmen, we were talking about what I consider to be criminal acts of negligence by landlords, not just in the Bronx, but throughout America. My question is, how do the landlords even get away with neglect that results in unsafe housing, um, just falling, buildings that are falling apart. I, it, it just escapes me. Tell me about that. So although there's systems and procedures in mm -hmm. place, for instance, in New York City, mm -hmm. if you have a complaint with your building, whether it's maintenance, repairs, you can call 311. And then they would dispatch somebody from HPD, Housing Preservation mm -hmm. Development, or perhaps somebody from the Department of Buildings, DOB. But the reality is that they issue violations if they actually see that there is a violation. For instance, mm -hmm. if you have no heat and hot water. There are laws regulating the heat and hot law in New York City with regards to how much heat, at what periods during the day, at same as, as night. But if you call an HPD on Monday and HPD doesn't come till Thursday, the temperature may have changed. Of course. Right? So it's catch me if you can, when you can, if you can ever get me at all. And so even though there are systems and procedures mm -hmm. and places and, you know, ways of getting violations, that doesn't mean anything. Because, you, and for instance, in my building, we had 587 violations. That's which, amazing. And that's just HPD. Mm -hmm. We're not talking Department of Buildings. Right. And that was the tenants calling 311 and complaining about no heat and hot water, many repairs, elevators not working, uh, weatherization issues. And violation was given after violation after violation. But those violations then get negotiated in housing court with a judge. For instance, there was a situation once, and I had to testify against the number of violations and the dollar amount associated with those violations. And what happened? That amount was huge. And then all of a sudden, HPD's attorney is there with the landlord's attorney, and you're waiting to testify. And they're in, in front of the judge, and the judge says, go work it out. Go work it out. Go is, work go, it out. Go figure out a number that works for both parties that you can both agree to. What happens to the third party, the tenant, me and my neighbors, is we get lost. So there are these negotiations that happen right in front of the judge. They work out. And from a $150,000 violation, you went, wind up paying $4,000. And that's a smack on the wrist or the finger or whatever you want to call it, and nothing happens. The other issue is that there is no real accountability. Mm -hmm. Because all those violations... When you say that no accountability for the landlord, is it, is it, are we talking specifically no accountability for the landlords, the attorneys, even the judges? Well, for all of them, because okay. what happens is, you know, there, what I see in housing court, meaning that I've been there so many times, is that landlord attorneys have some privileges, whether they're written or not. They're there many more times than tenants are. They're like buddies. So I'm being brought there, but I'm not there every single day. And you, do, you develop relationship, even though that is unethical and shouldn't be happening. It happens. How is it that landlord attorneys are given conference rooms that are set aside oh. for a tenant to speak with their attorney, yet they're not supposed to have, they're not court employees, yet they have spaces where they have microwaves, they can check in their coats, they can check in with one another, they have privacy. What, what happens to the tenant? We don't have any of those spaces. We don't have any of those rights. So what I'm hearing is that there's like this uh, good old boys, you know, uh, buddy club going on in housing courts between uh, the landlords, the landlord's attorneys, and I dare say even the judges, because it, it escapes me. I don't understand how this can continue to go to happen. And while you have tenants going to court, sometimes in numbers, while the judges are just dismissing the tenants as if they are irrelevant in the big scheme of things. Well, yes, and remember that each judge runs their own court. They, you know, in their own room. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. I was in trial with my landlord, and trial begins at 9.30 a.m. It is now 20 to 11. And by 11 o'clock, that trial, or the landlord's attorney, they could have, the judge could have defaulted. Wow. So how is it that the judge then gives the instruction to the landlord, the son who's there, who showed up late. We were there since 9 a.m. in the courtroom at 9.30 respecting the judge. 
And all of a sudden, instruction is given to the court clerk to track down the attorney for the landlord because he's running late and they're going to default the case and it's going to close at 11. How is it that the clerk had the number to the landlord's attorney to call? And also, they also instructed the son of the landlord who was there to also call his attorney and remind him that if he's not there by the next 20 minutes, they're going to default the case. The landlord's attorney showed up three minutes to 11 and the case was on. I, along with my attorneys and everyone in that courtroom, was stunned and shocked by what we just saw and heard. Wow. Because I'm sure that if it was me running late because I had an emergency or wasn't feeling well, that no one would be calling me or looking for me to show up to court before the case is defaulted on and I lose my case. We have a couple of minutes and and I want to just make sure that we cover um, the campaign for justice in housing court and the right to uh, the right to counsel uh, because there's so much to talk about and this is such a loaded topic uh, but tell us about uh, that in that particularly, I have one minute. So uh, there's been a particular campaign that is about the justice in in housing court. Is there some type of a campaign? Sorry, as I mentioned this? earlier, the housing court campaign. Basically, we drafted a report called Tipping the Skill, which mm -hmm. everyone can get on the CASA's website. Mm -hmm. uh, you can read the report in detail. But we came up with recommendations. Some of the basic recommendation is that all court employees should wear IDs. Mm -hmm. That the judges should fully allocate the stipulations that um, there should be a bilingual PowerPoint in the courtroom, that the judges should be at the bench on time and do an overview of what happens in court and what okay. the expectations right. are, mm -hmm. and many, many more. What grew out of the housing court campaign was that many of us thought when we went uh, to housing court or we were taken to court for frivolous court proceedings that we would be um, appointed an attorney. Well, that doesn't happen in housing court. You get that in criminal court and sometimes you get that in family court. So out of housing court campaign grew the right to counsel intro 214. And right now the mayor, a few weeks ago, along with the speaker, have supported the right to counsel intro 214 to make universal access to have an attorney appointed for those that are making 200, a 200% federal of income guideline to have representation, which means around $49,000. Because right now, 99% or 98% of the tenants taken to housing court have no representation, yet attorneys have 98% of the representation. Okay, we're going to go to break, but I want to dig more into that and talk uh, specifically about uh, the right to counsel and a couple of other topics. Sure. All right, so legitimate matters. This is William Paris. Great topic. If you don't live in the Bronx, you still need to pay attention. We'll be right back. My name is Carmen Vega Rivera. 36 years ago, I moved to the Southwest Bronx, thinking I was moving up, working for the Bronx Museum of the Arts. I had a wonderful landlord then, and a few years later they passed, and the receivership was given to the existing landlord. I have been in court with this landlord and fighting him for 20 years, but he took me to court when I started to enforce an ask for my rights since I was paying for rent. Some of those basic rights were heat and hot water, elevator service, cleanliness, building maintenance, building repairs, and individual apartment repairs. None which have ever been implemented or taken care of. They were actually unresponsive. I just want to say how excited I am to be here as someone who is not from New York City. This is a beautiful day, an exciting day, and the eyes of this nation are on New York City. This will be the first legislative body to pass a right to counsel in evictions and foreclosures. The first body in this country to do what we all know should have been done decades if not centuries 
ago. I urge you to take that last step and to know that New York City will be the leader in showing what justice for all can look like in this country. Do not give up because intro 214, we're going to work until it is passed and put it to local law. Welcome back to Legitimate Matters. This is your host, William Paris. I'm having a great conversation today with my guest, Carmen Vega Rivera from CASA. And uh, before we went to break, we were talking about the right to counsel in housing court. A huge accomplishment, Carmen. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand that the right to counsel is the first that had, is the first legislation, not just in the Bronx, but in America. Is that right? That's exactly right. We will be the first. And so the mayor obviously, you know, being that he's running for office again, <laughs> picked a really okay. good one um, to support the right, right to counsel. And don't forget, the right to counsel is citywide. Okay. And so this is huge. We've been fighting for this for the past two years. Had a lot of support, 43 council members. Okay. It was sponsored by Mark Levine from Inwood and Washington Heights area, along with our own City Council Member Vanessa Gibson. And you also had a week. Uh, CASA spent a whole week where um, there were uh, community people that went to City Hall and the chamber um, and, 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 and filled the chamber, rather, with, with uh, two capacity. And it was seven hours of testimonies, I understand. It was a full day. I actually was one of the MCs, along with uh, City Council Member Mark Levine. Vanessa, our city owned, you know, city council person, but Vanessa was there. Many other city council members that supported the bill were presenting. Mm -hmm. We then testified inside the chamber. Um, I was one of the folks that testified along with other neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, labor, and other folks about the importance of the right to counsel. Just imagine going into housing court and not having any re representation wow. by an attorney. This is a big that deal. That increases displacement mm -hmm. because what happens is, in most cases, the tenant loses, they're pro se. Mm -hmm. And when you lose, you start going into the next step, which is the eviction process. Wow, wow. Now, you mentioned uh, Vanessa uh, Gibson, who in District 16 in the Bronx, is the, is, she's a council member. Yes, right? she is. So, so what is her role? And she represents Community Planning Board 4, which is my community planning mm -hmm. board. And her role is to um, listen and represent the interests of her constituents. Well, this is very, and when you say constituents, I just want to make sure the viewers understand, when you say constituents, you're referring to the people in the community. In Community Planning Board 4 in and, District 16. And she's an elected official. She's an elected official, okay. and of course, it's the people that vote for her and put her yeah. in this position. So therefore, she has to represent our interests. So this is a point that I really want to make. Um, it's important that people watching understand that organizations like CASA are joining together. They're joining forces. There's, there's strength in numbers. And CASA has organized uh, communities throughout the Bronx to really make a difference in the Bronx, to push legislation for uh, the right to counsel, among many other things. And this is not the only thing that's happening in the Bronx, but it's important that every individual understands that it's important to vote, that it's important to hold our council members uh, accountable for representing and hearing the voices of the people in the community. Exactly so. Mm -hmm. And through CASA's work, we do it through collective action. We meet with her frequently, okay. um, constantly. We are telling her what the concerns are. We're coming with our platforms. Mm -hmm. We're coming with our demands. We're coming with our recommendations. And we feed her the information so that she owns it. Because if she doesn't own it, She's not going to have an understanding of what is it that we want, or, and she's not able to represent our needs when she's there in city council fighting. For instance, she, we've been meeting with her constantly, not only for the right, uh, with, with the issue of the right to uh, council with intro 214, mm -hmm. but the rezoning. The rezoning in the Southwest Bronx, which is 73 blocks from 167 to 184 mm -hmm. and a half mm -hmm. mile radius, it is Vanessa Gibson, along with the other city council member and community planning board five, Fernando Cabrera, but Gibson's community has the majority that's going to have to say about what happens in the Southwest Bronx. Wow. We, the tenants, we, the community, we, the labor, we, the small businesses, the auto workers, have to let, us, let her know, as well as Cabrera, what is it we want and what is it that we don't want. And we have to do that collectively. 
in action by deciding what's in the best interest of this community. We know it. We live there. We eat there. We shop there. Mm -hmm. And she's representing our needs. And if you don't do it and you're not meeting with her and you're not sharing with her and you're not demanding and you're not putting her feet to the fire and holding her accountable, right. then you're not going to get what you want. Now, very quickly, <clears throat> I want to talk about the, the responsibility of every individual, regardless of what community you live in. What action should you be taking? Who should you be reaching out to? Because CASA is organized. But there are so many people in various communities with, throughout the country, they don't really know, who do, I, who do I call? What is the first step? I'm having a problem in my building. What do I do? Well, I can't answer for everybody, but mm -hmm. I'm sure that, mm -hmm. you know, in government is structured in a particular way, whether you're calling the operator, whether you're calling 411, you have to understand how government is structured. Mm -hmm. Locally, when I ask folks, do you know what community planning board you live in? They go, what's that? Right, they don't and even they know. They don't know. So they you have know. to start with the basics. So you start with what community planning board do you live in? What district do you live in? Right. Do you know that you're in the, the poorest congressional district? No, I didn't know. You need to know who your city council is. Mm -hmm. You need to know who your senator is. You, know, you need to know who your assembly folks are. You need to know who your congressman is. And in our community, sometimes people don't know. And it's up to us to take that first step. And all of this information is available online. Online. or Sometimes in, in New York City, you can call 401 and get help and seek who are the elected officials in your district. And start by getting one phone number. Okay. Start by getting one address. And start by visiting because that's going to lead you to the next person, to the next person, and to the next person. And then start collecting the data. You know, take index cards. And start writing the information. Have it because it's going to be useful information. You will always need it. And if you live in a residential building, it's important to talk to other residents within your building and start collectively um, uh, having a voice and, ma and making a difference. Don't allow your landlord or elected officials to just get away with, number one, just not taking at Tenants not, have rights. I'm going to say that again. Rights. Exclamation tenants, point. Tenants, tenants have, rights. have rights. Throughout and we have the to country. exercise it all yes. the time. Throughout the country. Throughout the entire United States. Well, Carmen, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. You are a wealth of information. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. William. Thank you so much for watching Legitimate Matters. I'm your host, William Paris. Please remember to tune in on Sunday evenings at 11 p.m. on, on uh, Cablevision's BronxNet Channel 68. Thank you so much for watching. Legitimate Matters. This is your host, William Paris. I want to thank my guest this week, CASA leader, Carmen Vega Rivera. For more information on Legitimate Matters and upcoming shows, follow me on Facebook.com slash Legitimate Matters or my YouTube channel, Legitimate Matters, or email me 